One of the pressing questions in our world is the relationships between religions. And I'm very pleased to have Archbishop Kevin MacDonald here today to talk about Catholicism and other religions. Kevin, over to you. How, do, how does Catholicism see its relationship with other religions? Well, I think it's important to make the point that the way in which um, Catholicism sees its relation to other religions uh, was set out and defined, really, 50 years ago uh, in Nostra Aetate, in the Declaration of the Second Vatican Council on the relationship of the Church uh, to other religions. Um, it talked uh, specifically about Judaism, and but in relation to all uh, religions, it spoke in terms of the connectedness uh, between uh, the church and other religions, and, and not in adversari an adversarial sort of way. Um, as, uh, as well as the major affirmations about the Jews, it spoke about Islam. It didn't say, it's a very short document. It didn't say a great deal. It didn't answer all the questions. But it affirmed uh, that uh, Muslims worship the one God. Uh, and it affirmed that they recognized um, Abraham uh, as their father in faith. So it affirmed a commonality, and that's very important because I think people are very quick uh, to, to point out uh, the, 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 the conflicts between religions. People, it seems to me, don't instinctively want to engage with um, uh, what, what religions have in common. Um, that emerges when, you, when you, you're actually in dialogue. But that's a very uh, important. Now, so those are the, the two, uh, if you like, West Asian religions, what some people would call the Abrahamic religions. Uh, but as well as that, um, uh, there is the whole question of the Eastern religions. Now, the Second Vatican Council was important because for the first time, there was a very significant number of bishops from countries which have a non-Christian majority. Most councils in the history of the church have been largely uh, European and Middle Eastern. Uh, and so it did refer, albeit briefly, to the, what we might call the Dharmic religions, the religions that, that in, uh, originated in India, as opposed um, uh, to the Middle East, which, are of course, are quite different in kind. But it, what, what it said was quite simply that the Council uh, affirms everything that is true and holy in those religions. And that is very important, that it, it had a positive word to say about the other religions. Uh, long before the Council, um, monks in particular had been going to India and the Far East to experience monasticism, to explore commonality between Western monasticism and uh, mass monasticism in the, in the East. But, but this, this um, uh, if, if you like, um, affirmed that, uh, that process, that those attempts at rapprochement, and integrated it into the vision uh, of the church. And Bede Griffiths once remarked that he saw a time coming when Indian religions would form a background to Christianity in the same way that Aristotle's philosophy had found a back, formed a background to the thought of Aquinas. And of course, there's the long tradition of the belief in the natural knowledge of God, that human beings have a knowledge of, of God. But it's going beyond that when you actually affirm the goodness in another religion as opposed to an abstract notion of the natural knowledge. Yes, I think it is. Um, I think that um, there are people who are doing work um, on the Eastern religions along the lines of the way in which St. Thomas used Aristotle. Uh, uh, because it, 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 there's a moot point of whether religion is the right word uh, for what we call the Eastern religions. Um, there, are, there are researchers who are looking at the philosophy uh, uh, underlying uh, Buddhism and Hinduism and seeing how that can engage with um, uh, w w w with Christianity. So that's a kind of a, a ongoing work. Uh, but I think that the, uh, that the, the, the affirming of people is part of 
the way in which the church has developed its outreach generally. Um, I think uh, uh, at the Second Vatican Council, um, it was said that the church is a sacrament or instrumental sign of intimate union with God and of unity with the whole human race. And I think this is uh, and a particularly important development in the uh, church's self-understanding with Paul VI's encyclical Ecclesiam Suam, in which he defined the church in terms of dialogue. Um, uh, and I think that has impacted uh, upon the way we reach out and perceive uh, people of other religions, in this case, the Eastern religions, uh, in a, a desire to, to, to serve, to listen, and, and to dialogue with them. Uh, and so I think there's been a sort of development in the way in which the church understands itself in relation to other religions. A, a key moment of that uh, was when uh, Pope John Paul II gathered together um, not only other Christian leaders, uh, but people of other religions to pray for peace in Assisi. Um, they didn't pray together because you pray according to your faith. The Christians did, but not the members of other religions. But there was, it was space for people to witness together and people to pray in their own way. Now, I mention this because the Pope didn't do that because he wanted to create an interfaith event. He did it because he felt as Pope that it, it was his responsibility uh, to do that. I worked in the Vatican for eight years in Christian unity. And Pope John Paul had a very strong sense of his global responsibility and his global role, as well as preaching the gospel all over the world. He, he met with and affirmed and encouraged uh, leaders of other religions. He was comfortable with that kind of profile. And I think, uh, getting back to the question you're asking, uh, the, the, the freedom and the sense of responsibility in affirming other religions has to be seen in that bigger context of developments in the church's self-understanding and in a particular way, develop in, uh, in developing the self-understanding of, uh, of the Pope. Um, an example of how it has developed is the fact that uh, last year, Pope Francis, when he went to the Holy Land, he invited uh, President Mahmoud Abbas uh, and Pre President uh, Shimon Peres, um, um, uh, 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 a Muslim and a Jew, to go to Rome to pray with him. And as far as I remember, there was no great admiratio about that. Nobody thought it was remarkable. Uh, and I think that, that fact shows that, that how there has been this cultural, psychological shift uh, in the profile uh, uh, of, uh, of the Catholic Church, which has you know, a theological basis rooted in the Council. When you actually get down onto the street level of Catholicism, how many Catholics would have actually absorbed the notion that when they're praying and their Jewish and Muslim neighbours are praying, that they're all praying to the same God? Well, I think that's about probably going a bit too far to put it quite like that. Um, um, I think what um, I think is first of all uh, that, that what Pope John Paul did say uh, was that every authentic prayer, he said this in Assisi, is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So he did affirm there, and also in his encyclical Redemptorius Missio, the activity of the Holy Spirit uh, in the lives and in the spirit, spirituality of people outside the church, without, of course, ever compromising uh, the, the fundamentals of, of the self-understanding of the Catholic Church as the locus of uh, uh, of the ac activity of the Holy Spirit for salvation, for life, for mission. Um, but um, he, d he, uh, he did affirm uh, that the activity of the Holy Spirit in, uh, in other religions. Um, now, uh, to, to, uh, to what extent are um, Catholics gener generally alert to that? I think it depends. I think with regard to, the, if you like, the receiving of the, the Second Vatican Council in the Church, I think a lot of Catholics think of it, of the change in terms of the liturgy, because that's something they're confronted with every Sunday. 
it's not in, in, in Latin, it's in your own language. I think things like ecumenism and interreligious dialogue, I think one has to say it has been very patchy, the way, the extent to which that has been received and absorbed into the, into the lifeblood of Catholicism. Some have latched onto it very strongly, others haven't. But I think when you're talking about a sea change of the, of the magnitude of the Second Vatican Council, that's not really surprising. Do you think it's going to keep going? Do you think that sea change is going to take place? I think it's ongoing. Um, um, it, it, it's ongoing uh, because um, uh, it cannot be otherwise. I think the, uh, the church has, is developing. It's, uh, it's reaching out. Um, we, in Pope Francis, uh, it, it's very interesting that a lot of people seem to think that his his person and his words matter to them, the most unlikely people, and they probably have a problem explaining why. But I do I do think uh, the, there is an organic uh, growth of self understanding by the Catholic Church, which which, as I repeat, doesn't involve uh, sacrificing our belief that we're at the center of the concentric circles, so to speak, mm. uh, but relates to, uh, to the others in, in, a quite new, in a quite new way. Kevin, thank you very much. <laughs>